where you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you're going through in these days, the Lord is on the throne yesterday, today, and forever. You know, we live in a, a day of remakes and sequels, don't we? It's really quite agitating. Most of the live-action Disney re remakes are at best money grabs, and at worst, they're this new attempt to indoctrinate children. You're like, tell us how you really feel about it, man. I will. In fact, the more they try to make some of those great remake some of those great old animated films, the more agitated I get. There was one remake of an old Disney animated film, a uh, live action that Jamie and I actually enjoyed, and that was uh, the Cinderella live action remake. And in that, <laughs> you're laughing. Yeah, I liked Cinderella, Joshi. I did. <laughs> in the film, when Cinderella gets to her absolute lowest, the circumstances couldn't be worse. This little old lady approaches her for a glass of milk. And she thinks she's just talking to a thirsty and haggard elderly woman in this scene. But she's actually talking to her fairy godmother in disguise, the one who has the power to transform her and get her to the ball. Albeit a very quirky fairy godmother. But as you turn this morning to Nehemiah 2, if you go halfway in your Bible, you have the Psalms, and then you just turn back a few books, and you'll be in Nehemiah, about three books before the Psalms. It says this in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4, Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So, Nehemiah says, I prayed to the God of heaven. Church, often we don't know who we're talking to when we pray, or at least we're not mindful of it. Do you hear that? You're not merely praying to do something with your stress. You're not merely praying to meditate on peaceful thoughts. You're not merely praying to have a nice and loving God hear you. You are praying to the God of heaven. You are praying to the Lord who reigns with all authority. And I would just say when your earthly helps are not enough and it's only a matter of time, before your confidence in the things of this world gets shattered in some way, you too can turn to the God of heaven. Do you know him? Do you talk to him? And do you trust him? The title of this message, Renewing Your Prayer Life. And some of you might be looking at me. That was the title last week. Okay, I'm doing a remake. I'm doing a, I'm doing a sequel. Renewing Your Prayer Life Part 2. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning as we turn to it. We don't just turn to words on a page. We don't just turn to the thoughts of man written down thousands of years ago. We turn to the God of heaven and what he has communicated for us. Impress your word upon not only our thoughts, but our hearts through faith that you might transform us closer to the image of the Lord Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our great shepherd. And so have your way, not only, uh, Lord, in this time, this morning, but through our lives, have your way. We would pray in Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1, this is a continuation of chapter 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Start with this, your prayer life will be renewed when your focus is steadfast. When your focus is steadfast. To set the context again, this is the continuation of the account that we began last week in chapter 1. Nehemiah's mind has been on the purposes of the Lord. His heart has been earnest with devotion to the Lord. And he has been humble and he has confessed sin before the Lord. 
Devotion to the Lord and his purposes along with the confession of sin is, listen, the foundation to a transformed prayer life. Let me say that again. Devotion to the Lord and his purposes along with the confession of sin is the foundation to a transformed prayer life. Almighty God wants to take our mere pleas for help and blessing and transform us into a people of par powerful partnership with him. He wants to take our mere pleas for help and blessing and transform us into a people of powerful partnership with him. When Nehemiah heard the condition of God's people back in chapter one, it says in verse four, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and I mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And then you notice still in chapter two, this inclusio clues us into what's going on, that this is one account, that this is one section where God wants us to know something. And here's the inclusio, verse four, then the king just said to me, what are you requesting? So again, Nehemiah says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. And the, the, the details are captured as well back in the second half of verse one, chapter one, at the very beginning. Now it happened in the month of Chislev. That's our November, December time period. Verse uh, one here in chapter two, in the month of Nisan, which is our April and May. Nehemiah had been praying to the God of heaven for five months. You flip a page, I flip a page, and we're like, okay, five months before approaching the earthly king with his request. How many times do we proceed with a major decision or a, an action without prayer? Or if it's really, really heavy, maybe we set aside a day or even a week to pray about it. Nehemiah devoted himself for five months on this. And his sadness of heart that is pointed out here is referring to his countenance about it before King Artaxerxes. He's still ripped up by the state of Jerusalem. He's still wrecked by the condition of the people of God. And so he's praying. He's still praying. And he has not stopped. He's still crying out for help, the help of the Lord. He is steadfast in pressing into the Lord. Sometimes we wonder with a, a particular circumstance that we face. What's God's will on this? What's God's will for me? What's God's will regarding my job? What's God's uh, will regarding moving or a new house? Or what, what's God's will regarding this conflict that I'm having? And so we say a prayer or two. But here's the thing, friends. God's ability to overcome your problem or his ability to be able to, to guide you through it is not that difficult for him. The Lord loves you and he definitely cares about your burdens. He definitely wants to help you, but he does not ever grieve the difficulty level of our circumstances. He grieves how little we entrust ourselves to him. Luke 18, it says of Jesus, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. When you're reading that, you're like, I wonder what this parable is about. To the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her, continually, her continual coming. And the Lord said, Jesus said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Never stop praying. Never stop praying. Never stop casting into the Lord your confidence, your dependence. Never stop pressing into him. 
And the Lord may not answer you according to your desires, but you're pressing into the one whose knowledge is higher. You're pressing into the one whose love is better. You're pressing into the one whose power is greater. And he will help you in ways you haven't even thought to pray for. In one assignment, one paper in my graduate studies, I wrote this paper about Charles Spurgeon, and I wrote, what single characteristic best defines the ministry of Charles Haddon Spurgeon? Was it the great mark he left on Reformed theology that is carried through today? Was it his widespread reputation as a brilliant orator of God's word? Was it his prolific writing that has stood the test of time? Was it his passionate dedication to saving lost souls? While all of these characteristics make Spurgeon one of the greatest pastors in the last 200 years, none of these may be the single most defining thing about his ministry. He once preached on prayer and said, power in prayer is very much the gauge of our spiritual condition. And when that is secured to us in a high degree, we are favored as to all other matters. Spurgeon also once said this of his mother, how can I ever forget when she bowed her knee and with her arms about my neck prayed, oh, that my son may live before thee. So often we say a couple of prayers to seek the Lord's help and guidance on something. When 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Your prayer life will be renewed when your focus is steadfast. And then, second half of verse 2, then I was very much afraid. Nehemiah speaking, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? Your prayer life will be renewed when you've prayed so much, it evokes courage. You've prayed so much, it evokes courage. In the ancient Near East, listen now, kings did not take chances with people. No king in the ancient world be like, oh, cool, you want to you wanna go rebuild a city that was once my enemy? resting right next to another country that is still my enemy? You want to go rebuild, fortify that city, get the people back together? Cool. No king would say that. In the ancient world, kings are always concerned that somebody's plotting against them. In fact, this could have been the real motivation behind his concern for Nehemiah's sadness. Why are you downcast? Do you know something I should know? Could have been self-focused. And I say all that to say this. This was the reason for Nehemiah's fear. The text says, then I was very much afraid, which shows us the courage he's exhibiting. Think about what Nehemiah is asking. Hey, um, could you let me leave your service for a while to build up a foreign city? A city that, yeah, someday it could become a threat to you. A city that could, yeah, unite with another country, and rebel against you in this kingdom. A king would usually become very, very suspicious. And Nehemiah's cupbearer would, 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 would have been very familiar with that. There's countless examples, by the way, countless captured in record of kings who just took somebody out, killed them just because they were a little, their own family, just because they were a little suspicious of rebellion. And so where does that kind of courage come from? To put his neck out there. It's obvious at this point in the account, the king said to me, what are you requesting? And it reiterates, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah has been praying and patiently waiting for this moment. And so notice he has fully entrusted himself to the God of heaven. And then he does something courageous for the purposes of God. 
once heard about Oliver Cromwell. Now, Oliver Cromwell, uh, his faith in the Lord, he was a believer, but his, his faith and his character have mixed reviews, historically speaking. But he led several uh, successful military campaigns during England's first and second civil wars to hold the nation together. Um, he was known in those um, times of leading troops to have said this, put your trust in God, my boys, and keep your powder dry. You see, when uh, soldiers were marching through 7th century England in rainy, rainy England, oftentimes they had to really protect that, that gunpowder that was on their side. If it even got a little wet, it was useless. And so they wouldn't be able to use it. And so the maxim, trust in God and keep your powder dry, means yes, yes, trust the Lord to help you and, and to do something practical. The Lord is the one who works in power in and through our lives. It is the Lord who works in power in and through our lives. But he often works when we respond to his word and do something courageous in response to him. If you don't know if God has called you to act courageously on his behalf and for his purposes, you haven't prayed enough. Your prayer life will be renewed. It will be taken to the next level. When you've prayed so much, it, ever, it evokes courage in your life to act. And then verse six, second half. So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given, to, given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And that's quite a request. Give me letters to tell everybody to support what I'm doing and to let me pass. But it says this, and the king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Your prayer life will be renewed when you entrust yourself to the divine king, when you entrust yourself to the divine king. Notice the authorities that are repetitively represented here. So verse six, so it pleased the king to send me. And then verse seven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters uh, be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river. And then notice verse eight, second half, and the king granted me what I asked for. All these authorities, Nehemiah is saying, it was amazing. All these authorities got in line for the good hand of my God was upon me. Church, the hand of God is stronger than any human authority. Any. The hand of God is stronger than any human authority. Remember chapter one, verse four, I continued in fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And now chapter two, verse four, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Listen, we should participate and vote according to our convictions when we vote. It is, it is a gift. It is a freedom we should participate in because we vote with a Christian conscience. But no matter who's elected in November, Proverbs 21, 1 says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. We should pray for our country and we should live in such a way that we're looking to build up our country. But no matter what nation could or might or should surpass the U.S. in power, Psalm twenty two twenty eight 28 says, for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. No matter the challenging season ahead for the people of God, because I think many of us are seeing there's a challenging season ahead. It's going to get harder. No matter the challenging season ahead. Daniel 2.20 says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. Listen, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. It's all in the hand of God. I don't want bad things to happen. I don't want life to become more difficult for followers of Christ. But as one who trusts in the Lord, I must remember, as Psalm 72 says, may all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Here it is. For he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor and him who has no helper. 
God cares for the lowly. God cares for those who don't have the power as the highest authority. And don't miss this. Don't miss this church. One day, Jesus Christ will return and everyone will know in an instant, everyone. Revelation 19 captures it when it says on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So when Nehemiah says, I prayed to the God of heaven, Jesus, after his resurrection said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has all authority on heaven and earth. And that is why his people respond. It's captured in Revelation 19.6 like this. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, so great, crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. He has all authority. There's a part of your heart, there's a part of your soul that engages in the things you engage in simply because you're longing for that. You're longing for him to take that authority, to step into that authority, to bring justice, to bring deliverance, and you'll spend that energy wherever you can find it. But sometimes God calls us just to lower ourselves, just to humble our hearts, as the lowly, as the needy, as the poor, and to cry out to him and to wait on him. He reigns. Christ has all authority. Your prayer life will be renewed when your mind then is on his purposes. Your prayer life will be renewed when your heart is earnest with devotion for him. Your prayer life will be renewed when you're humble enough to confess your sin to him. Your prayer life will be renewed when you know what God has said and your confidence is in it. Your prayer life will be renewed when your focus is steadfast and you've prayed so much, it evokes courage to act. And so finally, because you entrust yourself to the divine king, Church the Lord, your Lord, he will return. He will come with justice and salvation. He will renew this world that we live in. He will reign over it, finally, someone with righteousness. And he will never let you go. Amen. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Let's pray together. God, I pray that you would set our hearts upon your presence, your truth, your wisdom, your nearness. Lord, that we'd set our hearts upon your ultimate reign. You are in control. You are sovereign. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Nothing can happen in and around us but by you allowing it to happen, and your designs will never be thwarted. They'll never be stopped. Your purposes, your redemption, your salvation, your justice to come someday cannot be disqualified. Nothing on earth can halt it. So give us hearts to entrust ourselves to you, to humbly come before you confessing that we know the king of the universe, and we can trust him. Make us steadfast. Make us devoted to our fellowship with you. Draw us close that we would confidently entrust our hearts to the king of the universe. God, have your way. We pray in Christ's name.